Okay, so in this video we're going to be talking about the Schrodinger equation, which is this equation that you see right here. Now, at first it looks quite complicated, but you will see that as we go along, it actually isn't that complex. The really beautiful thing about this equation is that it pretty much encapsulates the entire behavior of a quantum system. In fact, what we have here is we have the wave function, and we have a bunch of other terms. So this term right here, that's just the Nabla operator, which we recognize as just the sum of the second partial derivatives of any function. In this case, we have psi, so that's capital psi. And this is simply going to be the sum of the second uh, order partial derivatives of that particular function. And notice that I am using the notation here, I'm using the vector notation to imply that this is actually a function of all three variables, x, y, and z, in the space uh, dimensions, and also a function of t, which is time. So this is the Nabla operator, which you will recognize from uh, other places. Here we have the reduced Planck's constant. We have the mass of the particle, so if this represents the wave function of the particle, this is going to be its mass. And here we have a potential function, so V is just a function of the potential energy of that associated with the, with the system in question. On this side of the equation we have the imaginary unit I, we have the reduced Planck's constant again, and we have the time derivative of that particular wave function. So this seems all a little bit complicated, but let's have a look at it to see if we can infer some meaning from it. So the first thing I want to do is I am going to, instead of considering the case with three dimensions, let's just consider the one dimensional equivalent in which x is just simply going to be x and everything else is just going to be zero. So this is going to be the one dimensional case. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the function or the wave function and as we have done in the past with um, other partial differential equations, we're going to assume that the solution is separable. So we're going to start by guessing that the solution can be separated into two independent functions, in this case lowercase i, and we're also going to have another function, capital T of time. So the product of those two functions will give us the solution to that partial differential equation. Now what we're going to do is we're going to evaluate the derivative. So let's start with the second derivative with respect to um, space. So this is going to be x. And it's simply going to act on this one. So let's have psi double dash and then we're going to have uh, t. So that's going to be the second partial derivative with respect to x. And now the time derivative is going to follow the same logic. We're going to have psi is going to remain constant and now we're going to have t prime so now what we're going to do is we're going to replace this back into the equation here above so let's rewrite this equation we're going to have h squared 2m now here we're going to have the second derivative with respect to x so this is going to be this term here t now here we're going to have our potential function, so this one is going to be one dimensional as well, times the function itself, so the function itself is just going to be this, so psi times t, and then on the other side we're going to have i h bar, and we're going to have the time derivative, which we just said is just this term here, so we're going to have psi t prime. Now, as is common with separation of variables, what we're going to do is we're going to divide everything through by the function itself. So we're going to divide the whole equation by the following term, psi t, it's just to separate the variables. So we're going to end up with some ratios that are independent of each other. So the first one is going to be psi double prime over psi plus v of x t times 1, because this is just going to become 1 once we divide it by this, and this is going to be i h bar, and then we're going to have t prime over t here. Now that we have separated those two things, we can actually solve for them independently. 
So let's say that both these equations is equal to some constant value E. So we don't know what that constant value E is, but we're just going to assume that they're both constant because we have just separated them. So the next thing to do is we can either solve for the space part or we can solve for the t part. Since the space part has this very generic term here, which we don't know what it is, we have to define it first. We're going to start with the time part, which is a lot easier to solve. So we're going to write i h bar t prime over t equals to e. Now what we're going to do is we're going to separate this. So we're going to have t prime over t equals to i e over h bar. So this is going to be minus. And the reason for this is that, remember, when we're dividing anything by i, it is the same as writing minus i times that particular thing. So that this is just the same as writing e over i h bar. Now what we're going to do is we're going to use integration. So this is just a first order uh, differential equation. It is quite easy to solve using the standard methods. So we're going to have the integral of dt over t is going to be equal to minus i e over h bar. All of this is going to be a constant integral of dt. So now we're going to have here is we're going to end up with natural log of t equals to minus i e over h bar times t plus some constant c and ultimately this is going to lead to the following solution t of t is going to be equal to some constant a times e to the minus i e h bar times t so this is going to be the solution of the time part and you will notice that this is actually going to always be the time solution to the Schrodinger equation regardless of what this term here is. So this is a really important result because that means that we, once we define what that potential function is, we can solve for the space part and then we can just multiply by this term here and that will give us the full time dependent solution to that problem. Now, usually, when we're talking about wave functions, as we have discussed previously, we actually want something, we actually want all terms to be normalized, which means that A should actually be just 1, if we want everything to be normalized to 1, because of probability theory. So, it is safe to assume that this is just going to be e to the minus e over h bar t. And the reason for this is that the normalization that we perform is usually done on the space part rather than the time part. So e even if A was in 1, it would actually be normalized by whatever we choose on the other solution. So we usually just select the time part to be equal to this. So what can we do with this now? Well, what we can do with this is we can go back to this form of the equation here. We can go back to this form of the equation, and then we can substitute that in. So just so you know, if we take the time derivative of this function, this is simply going to be minus i e over h bar t. Sorry, that's not t. That should just be e to the minus i e h bar t. And just for the sake, let's just assume that it is not normalized. So I'm just going to add that A constant there, just so that you know what's going to happen. Now we're going to substitute it back into this equation here. So we're going to start with minus H bar squared over 2M. We're going to have psi double prime of T. So T is just going to be A times E to the minus IE over H bar times T. So that's the first term here. The second term is going to be the potential energy. So that's going to be Vx of t times psi times t, which is a e to the minus i e h bar t. You get the idea. Equals to i h bar psi t prime. And t prime is just this. So this is going to be minus i e over h bar times a times e to the minus 
uh, e over h bar t. So this seems like a complicated thing, but now we can see, well, we can actually cancel out some terms here. We can easily cancel out all the a's, so it doesn't matter what value they have, they're always going to cancel out from the equation. And we can also cancel out this exponential term because it is present in every single one of the terms. Now the next thing we can do is we can cancel out this h bar and this h bar and then we have minus i times i so i squared is minus 1 and minus 1 times minus is just going to be plus 1. So what is going to happen in the end? We're going to have the following form of the equation and this is going to be the one dimensional equation plus sorry I forgot the psi double prime here plus v x t times psi equals to e psi and because there's no time dependence it is safe to assume that let, let's say that our potential energy is just dependent on space as well it's time independent so if we make that substitution let's make that substitution here plus vx Okay, so I'm just going to write it as a function of x now, so we know what we're talking about. And psi of x again. Now this is what we call the one-dimensional time-independent Schrodinger equation. And the reason for that is that there is no time dependence here. And you will notice that this is a really, really interesting expression because we can actually solve it using standard methods of solution for second order differential equations. Now we could easily extend this to the three-dimensional case. So all we're going to do for the time-independent Schrodinger equation is we're going to replace any functions by a function of three variables. And because this is a second derivative, it is going to be replaced by this Laplacian operator. So we're going to have psi of x vector, so that contains x, y, and z. Now we're going to have v of x vector, psi of x vector equals to e times psi of x vector. So this would be the three-dimensional time-independent Schrodinger equation. So if we have some potential that is independent of time, we can easily solve this for the space part and then we can simply multiply by the time part and that will give us the full solution for the time dependent Schrodinger equation. Now there, there's a really interesting fact about this and it is that this little constant E here is actually the energy levels of our quantum system. So the reason for that is that if we look at this from the point of view of operators, so let's rewrite this as minus h bar square over 2m Laplacian square. So that's Laplacian operator plus vx. Then we have psi x. So basically we're just factoring this out. This is this, Let's assume that these two are operators acting on psi. We're going to have e. And now this right here, because this is just the sum of the kinetic energy, so this is kinetic energy and this is potential energy, we call this the Hamiltonian operator, and it is usually denoted by h hat. So h hat of psi equals to e of psi. Now what does this tell you about the system? Because if the, this is the operator associated with energy, then that means that the observables, or essentially the eigenvalues here, because th this is an eigenvalue equation, we have an operator acting on the function, and it is giving us back the same function times some constant. So this is an eigenvalue equation. And what that means is that these are going to be the eigenvalues associated with this operator here, as we have seen in previous examples when we introduced the idea of operators. So that means that we're not going to have just one solution, but rather an infinite number of solutions, because we're going to have 
an infinite number of eigenvalues and for each of those eigenvalues we're going to have an eigenvector and that eigenvector is essentially going to be the solution for that particular eigenvalue and this is a really important thing because that means that the Schrodinger equation well at least the time independent case is actually an eigenvalue problem and can easily be solved by using some numerical methods and using matrices and linear algebra and that's a really really nice result so that is basically the the main connections between operators the Schrodinger equation and how we go from this seemingly overly complicated equation here at the top to something that actually makes some sense once you really delve deeper into it and in the next video we're actually gonna take the one-dimensional time independent Schrodinger equation and we're going to solve it for some simple cases just so that you get an idea of what what this all means in a physical uh, kind of setting